Okay, let's see if we are going live now. Let me just write the message first, just so that I don't click the clock last one. Yeah, we are now live. Oh. Yeah, we're now live. All right, cool. I can send you a link to it from here. Mm -hmm. That's good. All right, guys, if anyone is watching now, we are just getting things ready. Can I get an image as well? Hello, Rosanna. Thank you. All right, just give us a second and we'll be ready with all sorts of stuff. Hey guys, good evening everyone. It's still Elpida and I who is here, like we have been for the last few days. Hello. And we are just going to be doing some general sculpting on the Minotaur uh, using our lovely Schwarzenegger. And uh, we'll take questions and generally just have a good time today. Now we are just pushing it out on social media so people can actually <laughs> find link. But yeah, should be, should be good times. Two heavy neck muscles. Yeah, he is pretty beefy. So in what I'm doing now is the fir in the first stream, let me explain some things first. Uh, in the first stream, this was what I was doing. And that looks basic. <laughs> that was also during a Q&A. That's where we were just straight up just taking a lot of questions and like that. And then I'm taking it by myself a little bit off screen. And then I'm um, just sculpting a bit more on it. And then I am essentially refining him further and just taking him even further like that. You know, actually matching him up to some reference or straight up overlaying it. Not just using my intuition, but straight up overlaying things. Really looking at reference and really lining things up. And now I'm at a stage where things are kind of there in terms of like all the elements are there. We're not really adding a whole lot to him. And what I have to do now is I will go through and really analyze the reference, like new reference. Because what I had so far has been this guy, which is, which is great for anatomy. The problem with it though is that it's, um, it's, it's purely like a, a crochet. It, it has nothing to do with real world reference in a sense. It might be a foundation, but it's, it's not based on a real person. So uh, at that point, then you have to look at some actual people and then we have to compare it to that. And that's where I'll start using references from, uh, from I'm trying to find some <laughs> natural bodybuilders, which, you know, is not really that big of, that that easy to find some good references. So I'm kind of ending up with some stuff from Schwarzenegger from the 70s. And from this, I'll, I'll use it as um, general design and I'll uh, use it for general shapes. Because I want this guy to be really beefy, but I want him to feel more like more like this, more natural, instead of um, instead of like crazy, crazy roided up. Like you don't want to do this kind of stuff. This just looks flat out wrong. So uh, yeah, no, Arnold is not natty. Arnold is not natty one bit, but he's still not as extreme as some of the, the crazier things you saw like in the 90s and such, where they're just like complete beasts. Like Arnold is, is, a, is, a, is a beast, but you know, the, <laughs> there is like a level above that as well. So I'll just be going through and I'll try to replicate some of what I'm seeing in the delts specifically. I'm not very happy with how the delts are currently looking, they're too simple. So I want to, I want to break the delts up a bit more. This is where having scan reference would be amazing because then I can way more easily uh, really get some uh, like get the truth out there. <laughs> this is this is has so much spec and SSS and all that, but it's still it's still kind of useful. So I am just going over and I'm just trying to match a little bit of what I'm seeing in this. 
but also you know what I'm sculpting now you know more than feel more than, more than welcome to ask general questions uh, you're always welcome to to have just pick my brains when I'm working can't guarantee you that I'm gonna back to it right away but um, if more than happy to just generally answer questions And just as a common reminder, we have currently 50% off on all products on Flip Normals as part of our Black Friday sale, which is very exciting. Tons of cool stuff there. The one, the, the most exciting one, uh, I think personally, which I'm biased because I worked on it, is Intro to Sculpting. I'm really going through a lot of the things I'm, I'm talking about now, like way more in depth instead of just, I'm looking at it from reference. We, we actually cover how to, uh, how to sculpt more. Uh, I'm using Dynamesh right now. Uh, I've been using Dynamesh throughout the entire thing. I'm currently at 3 million polys. Uh, still just like 250 uh, in terms of like resolution. But yeah, I started with a sphere and then I'm still just working on that. Uh, there's no reason to use subdivisions at this this point. Uh, Dynam subdivision, or sorry, Dynamesh is, is, still, is still fine. And it means I can change things. For instance, I'm not sure if I'm going to keep the horns like that. It's just a lot easier if I want to change things when it comes to uh, just using just using Dynamesh. How long does it usually take to model something like this? I think I'm around like the seventh hour mark right now, but it depends entirely whether I'm using a base mesh or not. If I'm using a base mesh, then this is uh, this is. Uh, quite fast depending of course on how how refined the base mesh is but what i'm still spending time on is is main volumes like getting the leg volumes to look right and not just like specific muscles so it is just so much faster if you have a if you have a good base mesh to work from did you use a base mesh for this one sphere straight from a sphere yes. yeah you can see that in the original in the original stream that that's on youtube now so uh, just starting off with a sphere and just dragging things out and do you have any free courses? Uh, we, I mean, our entire YouTube channel is just it's just free courses. Uh, we, we, the primar primary thing we really have on YouTube is a lot of sculpting theory. So you can get a lot of, of really high quality sculpting stuff on, on our channel. We also have another channel as well called the Flipknowles Marketplace, which has more, more videos as well, uh, with more free chapters and such. Which is uh, we, which might have chapters from our actual sculpting series, but yeah, bunch of stuff on our YouTube channel. Thanks, Steve. Much appreciated. Are you gonna make pores with the Flipmoon skin kit? Probably. Yeah, I'll probably do some nice pores with uh, the skin kit at some point. For anyone wondering, I'll show you what I mean. Still typing with one hand with my left hand at that, so it's double fun to, to do anything here. But uh, <laughs> so here is the here's the skin kit. That that's the one I use a lot for it, where we sculpt it up to a lot of nice brushes, which allows you to really get these like fine wrinkles and pores and scales and everything in right away. So yeah, I'll definitely, I'll definitely use that once it's ready, but it's not ready yet. That's where one of the main things people mess up is they, they rush this stage here. If I rush this step right now, then I, I'll, I'll, I'll just like forfeit my entire sculpt. Then nothing good will come from it. You will have like a blob of potatoes with beautiful pores and wrinkles and all that, but it's just not ready yet. Like get your primary shapes right and doing your, then your mid frequency becomes so much easier. And if you get your mid frequency right, then uh, your texturing and your pores and everything becomes so much easier. So it starts with getting these shapes right. A lot of people might have already just rushed ahead and, and got bored <laughs> with this stage, but, uh, and including myself, <laughs> I mean, this is, you reach a point where you, it's not crazy fun, but um, you just have to squeeze out as much as you can from each frequency.
Do I showing the mesh on this? I suppose you mean the wireframe. I mean, it's uh, it's pretty simple. It's just straight up, straight up, just um, polygons doing their thing. So yeah, don't worry too much about topology at this stage. Just uh, keep it simple. Just at this point, it really shouldn't be have any focus on topology. You really just need to focus on the shape. Uh, if you if you rush the shape, it doesn't matter if you have the best topology in the world. Just get the shapes right. Yeah, quite a few polygons. We were up to like three and a half mil. So uh, you retope another software? Yeah, you you do. Uh, you don't. You can technically retope here, but it's it's rubbish. You you want to. Um, you want to retop with this and something else. I really like Maya for it, but you can also use um, you can also use um, Topogon, even Blender, Max, like really anything right now has has retopo baked into it uh, to some level. It might be an external plugin, but yeah, you you really don't want to do retopo in uh, in ZBrush. It's very painful. Quadra is great. Yes, it is. Can you do a general hint on the different levels or different poly counts on different phase of the sculpt, low, high, and mid? You, you can't really do that per se. Uh, like, I can't just give you like a poly count limit, not because I, I don't know it, just like I'm kind of sculpting with the same, with the same poly count now, al almost the same poly count throughout this entire the entire sculpt. I did just increase a little bit from around seven hundred thousand last stream to around three million now, but uh, you you really you, it, it's it, some some ways of working work really well if you have a high poly count. Like for instance, if you're using the clay brushes, using the clay brushes, you just want to have a high poly count from the beginning. Uh, using more standard brush and a smooth brush workflow, then you want to have a low poly count from the beginning. So it's not it's not a poly count thing. It's more are the shapes working kind of thing. Will the minotaur have veins along the arms and neck? Oh boy, it will. Uh, what I'm also thinking of doing is I'm thinking of giving him like this leathery feeling all the way around. Like I really like what's going on here. I have to refine a lot more, but I, I like that. It, it's almost like it's almost like he's like an infinite amount of years old. Maybe he's like 200 years old, like as a mythical beast. He's an incredible shape, and it's almost like his skeleton and uh, and muscles are just jacked like crazy. But it's like his skin has been sagging. So while you have an incredibly strong base underneath, almost like an old man bodybuilder, an incredibly strong base underneath, but the skin is more saggy. What's your opinion on matching focal lengths with ref? Uh, that is incredibly important if you want to have completely accurate camera matchups. In this case, it doesn't matter. And also I can't even try, like it's impossible for me to look at this and be like, ah, oh, that's a 52 millimeter lens or something. It's just, there's just no point in me even trying that. Uh, but also I'm not really matching it up. But if you are doing proper camera lineups, like if you're working in film or games and you really have to get the cameras, uh, you'll you'll you need the correct focal length. But for that purpose, you it will be done automatically for you. If you do if you get it through something like Photoscan, it will just set everything up for you in terms of that. It will read the camera data and it will just set it up properly. Thank you very much, Volgan. I appreciate that. Oh, somebody was asking before if I will texture him. Uh, probably not. Maybe, because uh, that's like a more, will I use this for a future flip normals tutorial? Maybe, who knows? But uh, probably not. I'm just doing this for the, uh, the sculpting challenge we have currently going, uh, the Sculpt November. You can find that on all our social media if you just search for uh, sculpt, the Sculpt November hashtag, which um, where the current theme is, is ancient. And I thought it would be cool to do something like like that, something which is ancient. The Minotaur would not be have armor 
And why am I sculpting an ortho view? Well, that is because I didn't see that it was an ortho view. <laughs> you don't sculpt an ortho view, sculpt in, uh, sculpt in perspective view. If you also, if you go on a draw, you can now set the, the different focal length. Uh, 50, 50 is fine. So um, just make sure you don't have something crazy like 200 or like 17. Uh, when sculpting, you said you prefer the A or T pose because of symmetry. If after you want to post it, you would retopo the sculpt, right? Yes, uh, I would retopo it. I would retopo him in this pose. I mean, this pose here would be fine for VFX as well. Maybe we'll move him, his arms a little bit out. But like this is this is not a terrible pose for rigging. You might have to give them a, like a more neutral one as well. But um, do it retopo in around this pose and then. Uh, and then uh, you can start posting him and doing that afterwards. How come ortho view isn't recommended for sculpting? That is an excellent question. Uh, the reason why you don't want to um, to do that is because ortho view doesn't exist in the real world. I guess technically it exists because perspective is an optical illusion. So I guess that's just kind of how it is. But if you're watching anything through, through like human eyes, which I assume most people are, or if you watch looking through a camera, you just have perspective, meaning stuff gets smaller as it goes into the camera. Um, as it goes further into it. So what you want to do is, you, you if you're going to be rendering this guy in Maya or Blender, you will always render it through a proper camera. And you want to, this guy to be as close as possible to what you're rendering, because otherwise it will not fit. Like, th th otherwise you're, in this case it's not that extreme, but let's say it's like a character which is more like oriented like this. It has like four arms and it's like this. You can see how different it becomes right now. So if you think it looks like this, but it actually looks like this in a render, you're just in the world of pain. So you want to make sure that it's as close as possible to what you're actually gonna be rendering. Oh, thank you, Cha Cha Charlie, 08. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, Cameron is also um, saying that ortho view is great if you want straight lines. For instance, if you that's one of the reasons I've been using it a, a little bit here as well. If you want to cut away like the arm legs here, for instance, it gives you a completely straight line. But if you use perspective and do this, you see the lines becomes it becomes a bit funky, particularly if you have symmetry off. Uh, it becomes like a well bad example. Uh, <laughs> it's very easy for it to become a case where it looks like this essentially. So if you're doing kind of some kind of selection sets or something like that, it's really useful to have ortho, uh, to work with ortho. But for reviewing, uh, you really want to stick to, to uh, perspective. Like the main sculpting, you want to stick to perspective. Order Morton to texture him. Yeah, you should. <laughs> Just have some a ball and chain and not let him go until it's done textured. Uh, do you prefer starting with a C sphere or a dynamic sphere? It, yeah, uh, both are both are fine. For for in this case, I started with a um, with a with a with a sphere. Uh, it's not necessarily the best option for for this. I actually prefer more C spheres because then I can. I, it's way quicker to block out a C sphere model than it is to block out a um, a dynamic one. But uh, it just depends. Sometimes you know there are cases where you you know it's better, but you don't want to do that. <laughs> you want to do it the way which you just think it's more fun, even though it's it's not the fastest way of doing it, if that makes sense. A lot of times for me, it's it's really not about what is the optimal way. If I was doing this the pure optimal way in terms of uh, in terms of fast results, I would have got a scan of a bodybuilder and just changed proportions and put a bull head on him. <laughs> Uh, will this be released after a stream? Yeah, we'll release this um, after the stream. The the streams from yesterday and uh, Monday, I think, they are also available. So you can see this entire progress, apart from a little gap in between this 
and apart from the gap between these two, this is not available. And one of the reasons was because I, I had to I had to do more design work. And that is incredibly hard for me to do while talking. I just need silence for that. There are a lot of people who can do that, but for me I just need I just need to sit down, match match reference, not answer questions, and just, just do that. So I just didn't want to I just didn't want that to be part of the stream. Um, Omar is asking, what focal length do you recommend general sculpting? Uh, I would I would say figure out what, what you're going to be rendering with and stick with that. Something like between 35 and 55, 50 millimeters is generally pretty safe because that's mostly what you're going to be rendering with. You want to avoid the more extreme ones. It's also because if you if you're working in something more standard, it means it can be you can work with it across scenes as well. So across across scenes and across people. So if imagine you have a you have a collaborative scene where everyone works in different focal lengths and uh, some are like 11, some are ortho, some are 3000 and they're trying to work together at the end. The, the characters wouldn't match up at all. It would just be all over the place. So just try to standardize it. Is this a stylized sculpt? Uh, I'm probably not going to end up it's probably not going to end up very stylized. It might look a little stylized now, but it's it's probably going to end up fairly realistic. You know, as realistic as a man with a bull head can be. What I also recommend you to do as well when you're sculpting is, is particularly if, you, if you're focusing on a nice result, is to start with a concept. In my case, I didn't, which is kind of enjoyable as well, but it's, it's 10 times harder. If I had a clear concept of this, I would have been like way, way further ahead. It's just really hard to concept for me, um, even though I've been doing this for a long time and partly professionally when it comes to concepting. It's just really hard, so particularly when sculpting live. So it's I highly advise getting actually getting a concept before you start properly. What would be your main go-to brushes? Uh, Damn standard and clay buildup. You can essentially do everything you ever need to do in with those those two brushes. Move brush as well, it's a standard brush, really simple stuff. Do you know any ways to improve creativity? That is a great question. One of the, this is, you know, this is a bit of a vague question, so I'll, I'll be a bit vague here as well. What what can help me a lot of times is, is to combine things which already exists and and do a lot of different things. When it comes to creative ideas, it's not that you, you work on one idea and, and that's it. I see this so often as a huge misconception misconception where you have you have like the master composer and he works on his masterpiece for three years and then he releases it and it's it's just the best thing ever you have the author who just works their entire life on the book and it comes out and it's just it's just phenomenal the master painter who just works on the masterpiece and all, all these kind of things and I don't think it works that way I think what you have to do you just have to produce a lot you just have to produce a lot of work and you have to put a lot of love into it and you have to iterate a lot a lot of creativity, like it's, it's even hard to explain what is creativity. But for me, creativity is about creating creating something new or taking something which exists and turning it into something new. And that's, it's like, it's a bit like a muscle. You get better at it the more you do it. It's not just like, a, oh, now I was creative and that was good. You you get better at it and it is, it is like, a, it is a skill you can actively train up through methodical practice. What purchases do you recommend for somebody who wants to get a hold of the basic and strives to make a short movie? That is a good question. I have one specific recommendation for you, which is, let me show you, we are on the Flip Normals Creator now. This is a list of all our exclusive products. And if we go down here, we have Introduction to Maya. Uh, this is this is a pretty, pretty interesting course because it covers essentially all the things for, at least a lot of things for a short movie, where 
it, we cover some some pipeline features, we cover lighting, we cover modeling, and we just get you an introduction to how it works. So I, I do recommend this course if you're interested in like getting a foundation for 3D, which you can then use to make a short movie. After that, you need some cinematography courses and all of that. But but just as a beginning, you need you need something like our introduction to Maya course, particularly if you want to work on shorts. Uh, you can also use uh, get an introduction to Blender as well, which is you know for obviously for Blender pretty similar. The one for Maya is a bit more extensive, but um, you need to understand one general 3D tool before working on shorts. I mean, you know, granted, of course, that your movie is a 3D movie. That's a pretty important one. Hey, thanks you, thank you, Georgie. I really appreciate that. The Volgan is asking: the more iterations, the more experience, and experience equals quality. Yeah, it's a tricky one, right? Because it's not, it's not like it's it's not that you want uh, just you want to just have qual quality or just one quantity. You want to have a lot of iterations where you feed get feedback on everything you're doing. I, I've seen people who have worked their who, who worked their butts off for just a few years and get got a really nice position in the industry, and I've seen people who worked for years and haven't progressed at all and the people who really progressed fast were people who just put in a lot of hours but just as importantly they got feedback on everything they iterated on their ideas they didn't just make 10 models and were like cool i, I now know how to model they made like one model got heavy feedback on that made another model and didn't make the same mistakes twice because they learned from the first one that's that's really a key way for me to do to of doing it you, you want it's like if you're learning a language you don't just want to open up a book and try to like practice something because you're gonna you're gonna screw it up and now you're gonna you're gonna practice wrong you want to open up a book maybe learn some things here and there then you immediately want to get feedback from somebody who speaks the language properly who can correct you and then you keep doing it do you ever sculpt these with uh with the, how any visual effects will look in mind. <sighs> I'm not really sure if I understand the question, to be honest. Um, if you're talking like, how would it look in shot? If so, I very much think about that. Um, kind of a tangent to that, which might be an important thing to talk about is, uh, in terms of like making a, if it, this was a concept thing for a movie, let's say I was doing, I was working on Hades the movie, and I was, I was tasked with sculpting this guy. There would be a few problems with this guy right away. Uh, and you would see this the moment you start doing animation tests. Currently, we don't necessarily know what those problems are. Some of them are that he doesn't really have a, an armpit. Another one is that he has the traps which are just made of iron, which means he, he just doesn't have that whole uh, crazy range of motion. So what you have to do if you are thinking about doing, working on this f f for a more serious production is you have to do animation tests. The way I would do that is, is quite simple really. You do some quick topology for him, just see your measure. You throw in an auto rig, and then you try to pose him. Does it work? Can you pose him? Can you get to the? Can you get the range of motion you need? If not, you address those issues, and then you try to do it again. Are you going to finish this one this week? Maybe. I would really like to. I'm going to be, I'm going to be streaming a fair bit this week as well, uh, all the way until probably Monday or Tuesday. Uh, also, as a little uh, as a little uh, bonus thing as well, Morton and I are probably doing a Q and A tomorrow as well. So if you guys have any cool questions for both of us, we're probably going to be doing it during the day tomorrow. Uh, just for reference, right now it's around ten thirty for me here. I'm currently in Denmark, so we're probably going to be doing it. I don't know, like maybe two o'clock or something. Two o'clock um, p.m. Two p.m. How do you stop these in films from looking fake? Assume this is like, how do you make, how, the question is essentially asking, how do you make K-1 
characters look real. One of the ways is you observe reference heavily. You don't assume you know what anything looks like and you truly, truly observe what the reference tells you. A lot of that would mean that you get proper reference in the first place and not just like looking at it like this, but uh, looking at this, but like if I was doing this for a film, I would have I would have bought a scan of a bodybuilder and I would have worked on top of that. Like it, just sculpting this for scratch is cool and all that, but if, if you are gonna be doing this seriously, buy like a hundred dollar scan and just straight up concept sculpt on top of that. Otherwise you're just you're just wasting your time. And it's it's very similar to a human anyway. The only thing is the bull head, which we can easily just sculpt on top anyway. You can even get like a scan of that as well. Like it's really hard to make realistic things for film. So it's not about cheating, it's just about using every single resource you have available to make it look as good as possible. Speaking of cheating though, we made a new YouTube video today you guys might like. It's, it's about um, the top hacks you really shouldn't do, but work, which works really well. One of them is actually about exactly that. It's about using, um, using scan data to, um, to start your sculpts. One of the problems when using scan data is that you might be using it as a crutch instead of learning truly what's how stuff works you might just be using it as a well i'll uh, i don't have to learn to sculpt because i have all these awesome scans here which is not how you should do it in general what is most soft uh being an animator or modeler yeah that is is, is very it's a very hard question what is most most sought after modeler or animator they both are heavily requested um, the one thing you're seeing now is they're both being automated to one degree. Each uh, where modeling is, is being, well, it's not necessarily automated. It is, uh, a lot of it is being done with photo scans now and then retopology being done in cheaper countries like India and China. Uh, while well, animation is, is also in parts being taken over by mocap. So it's a bit of a tricky one, but I really don't think animation is going away anytime soon. To put it like this, if you're a good modeler, and you know, it's, you're not in the middle of a pandemic, you're, you're gonna have a job as a good modeler. If you're a good animator, you're gonna have a job as a good animator. They're both sought after skills. And um, yeah, I, I can't recommend which one people should should pursue. That would be, that would be uh, something you have to figure out yourself based on what, what your interests are. If you want to be an animator, you, you just have to love animation. It's, it's, it's hard to switch from animation to something else because you're so specialized in that. It's probably easier to switch from something like modeling to environments or lighting. But switching from animation is, 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 is a tricky one. Throughout your career, any sculpts you are particularly proud of? Yeah, actually, one of my favorites was from uh, was from Pacific Rim Two, and uh, it got cancelled. <laughs> so that kind of sucked. Uh, the sculpt was all done, model was all done essentially, and then the sculpt that we're working on for a long time we just got like canned. So that uh, I'm probably more proud of that because it, it never made the light of day. So it's more like uh, 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 it's more like emotional, which is what tells me that. But um, one which was really fun to do was when I worked on a monster calls. That's a really lovely movie. Let's see if we can find it. Again, one hand typing. On there we go. Monster calls. This is a really fun one to work on. We had a concept called for it, but uh, I worked on this for like uh, for like six months. A lot of the head, a lot of the body, and just just did all sorts of things on this guy. So I really enjoyed this one. One of the things as well was that it's not necessarily the character itself. It's it's a team you're working with. And the team I had there was very small. It was just like myself and a few other guys and some supervisors and such. It wasn't like the bureaucracy of, uh, you, which you might have on bigger movies. Like if you're working on a big DC movie, you just have layers upon layers of people to go through. Here, they were more like, yeah, it looks really cool. Um, yeah, just send it to the director, that would be cool. Just, and, and go from there instead of just the endless bureaucracy. They can't make photo scans of things that doesn't exist, right? They need modelers for that. Yes, they do. Uh, they absolutely do. Um, they can make photo scans of you know most things if it's reference based. If it exists in a real world, they're gonna photo scan it, most likely. You know if they can get it. 
uh, but uh, for uh, for props which doesn't exist you know we still need modelers for that but that's all that's in large part been taken over by concept artists where they might be doing like a concept model and then the real like production modelers might uh, take over and re topologize or something like that but um, yeah the parts of that is definitely being being shifted away from where it was a few years ago Swan is asking, hey, I'm looking for a character modeling for a modeler for, fill, for games job, but I find it hard to, f uh, to find a job for that position. Do you know what would be a good starting position for, fresh, for a fresh graduate? Yeah, I mean, that, like, uh, half my answers are going to be, it, it really depends, but it, it does really depend. It depends heavily on your skills. If you are, if you have the skills to become a character artist, then 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 it's 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 a matter of time then you'd have to keep applying and all that and there are positions for junior character artists particularly in games not so much in film but for games there are but if you don't have the skills then the question becomes how do you then get into the field uh, i think personally it's much more important to get into the field just to get a source of income and get a network and then from there you can start to focus on the next step like I want to become a character artist. So then you, you have to talk to somebody professional in games about that. I don't want to give out advice on something I'm not qualified to talk about, but then find other positions there which might be easier to, to get into. Uh, character art is just particularly tricky. And I just want to say hello to the lovely Alpida, who is hello. still here with us in the stream and can take some of some questions, maybe while I'm sculpting. Hey, just had to do some stuff, but I'm here now. Let's move the mic a little bit closer to us both. Hey, hope people can hear me. Uh, you should take that question from Daniel. Um, how do you navigate between with topology? Uh, between what topology tool to use for film production. I wonder if I should retopple my character in Maya or practice getting good with the retopple tools in ZBrush. Well, in film, when I was working, we only used Maya for retopple. We never used ZBrush. The, we only used ZBrush if it was like a very cheeky background asset that would never move and it's very far back, then we all zero meshed it. But that's for very, very, very background stuff that no one wants to really see. But other than that, I would say stick to Maya for Retopo. I don't think there's enough um, control in ZBrush. Yeah, do you agree? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, the yeah. thing with retopology, it, it's not that hard to get used to new tools. Like I remember when I started with Blender, like after like two or three days with Blender, I was able to retopologize models at a fairly decent speed. It's because the tools are just, they are just very simple when it comes to it. Like they're very standardized what they can do. It's essentially draw out polygons and move the polygons into place. So it's like if you use, for instance, Topogun right now and your uh, studio will only use Max for retopology, it will shoot you into a from a cannon into the sun if you touch anything else but Max. You're just like, all right, cool, just show me the tools and I can do it. The concepts are simple enough to learn and I don't think it's a, I don't think that's really a huge problem, to be honest. Mm. There's a nice question by Marcin, Markin, I don't know. How about health versus working time? Do you want to take it or should I take that? <laughs> you, you okay, cry. I'll take that one. You cry a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Peter cries, and Peter cries a lot. I, I try to be more structured. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not necessarily just like working time. Like there is of course a max limit to how much you can work, but it's also about taking regular breaks and taking your health seriously, such as going to the gym and, and doing all these kind of things, but also just do stretches like if you do i don't do sculpting all day every day now so i very rarely have issues with my health in terms of like pure sculpting anymore but i used to uh, throughout my entire career i i always had issues with my with my health in terms of in terms of my my arm and my shoulder and all that and 
Well, that was 100% because I worked too much as a student. Like, 100%. Back in 2011, I just worked my butt off to become a better sculptor and artist. And I was paying for that for years. So, first off, try to not get injured. Take regular breaks. I had, an, I had a software called WorkCrave on my computer. I'm sure you can find something like that for a smartphone as well, which just tells you at regular intervals, being like, hey, buddy, you should probably just take a break now. And after I got hurt, I would just be religious about my breaks. Every 20 or 30 minutes, I would just take that two minute break. And I would just rest my hands. And even if it disrupted my flow a little bit, I would just do that because it was so important. And then I also find it now when it comes to like work from home as well, where I, I really, really have tried to have a separate room for working where like, it, it, I know it's hard, but if you, there is any way you can avoid working in the bedroom, try to do that because otherwise it's gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna be sleeping right next to where you're working and it just creates like a really bad mental head, mental headspace for you. Uh, I, I did it even as a student where we had a living room and I just moved my desk into the living room. It wasn't great, but it was either that or have it in my bedroom. And I really didn't want to do that. Mm. Will you ever make a full, make a character course, full character in Blender, sculpting, modeling, and UVs? Yeah, probably at some point. I'd love to do that. That sounds like a really fun one to do. Uh, it might not be in Blender initially, but I would really like to do a full course, like particularly with Seabrush and Maya. But Blender sounds really cool as well. Uh, the problem with Blender right now is that it's severely underdeveloped in terms of sculpting compared to ZBrush. So it will be, it's not an effective tool right now. So if you are doing it in a Blender, it would kind of be like, almost like, okay, look, we can do it in Blender. It's not the greatest tool for the job, but, it, but it's doable. Alberzo is asking, uh, which games, companies and movies have you worked on? It seems like a lot. You should go. Me? Uh, you should talk about what you worked on first. Oh. Like what, 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 what movie companies have you worked for? Uh, when it comes to movie companies, I've only worked from frame store so far. Um, uh, well, I've, uh, I started with frame store. I was first in advertisement. I worked a little bit in TV as well because those two are connected. Then I went to advertisement for Electric Theatre Collective in London, which was pretty fun, really fast paced. And then my last job was in Framestore again, and that's when I moved to film. Mm. And I've worked some, on some cool stuff there. Right. What about you? Yeah, what about me? Uh, <laughs> let me Google it. <laughs> <laughs> I am in the meantime, Toa is asking what's my background. I'm mainly a modeler. I'm a bit of a generalist, really, but I'm a modeler and mostly concentrating on uh, organic modeling as well. All right, so listen up. <laughs> so I started off at um, Framestore as a modeler in Paddington. Then I went to NPC and I, for one of the first thing I worked on was this one, Monster Trucks. That is an amazing movie. Monster Trucks, guys, 5.6 on IMDb. It's great. It's such a dumb movie, but it's, it's really good. Uh, awesome. I really enjoy this movie. When my friend and I worked on it, we watched it together. We were the only people in the cinema, apart from an old guy who was there. My friend rigged this guy, and uh, this guy was called in production was called Big Ugly <laughs> because he's big and he's ugly. So um, that was great. This is uh, that, yeah. That more... model kind of looks like my first shark model I ever made, <laughs> like when I was learning CG. That's great. So the whole premise is you have. You have these trucks, and inside the trucks there are uh, monsters. Hence, why it's called monster trucks. Because, yay, <laughs> that was great. But then I move on to moved on to a few different shows. I worked on Batman vs Superman, where I was working as one of many texture artists on Doomsday. I did some stuff on Ghostbusters, Suza Squad. Uh, went over to um, to NPC, where I worked on no sorry to DNA, where I worked on Pacific Rim and Venom. And now I am a basement dweller and I am uh, streaming <laughs> my sculpts on YouTube. So <laughs> yeah, that, that's kind of my background. How rewarding is the CG and 3D modeling industry? I know there are many artists in the field, but how do you actually get successful when talking about money? 
Oh, that's an interesting one. Dum, dum, dum. Dum, dum, dum. Uh, talking about money is always an interesting one. Uh, there, one of the things I, 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 I didn't really think about too much when I was a student was the fact that I didn't really think about money, which sounds weird, but once I got into the field, I was surprised that there is actually a viable career path for making a decent living when it comes to to this career. I mean, when you look at how much money the, the games and the movies are making, the, once you get a bit up in the system, more into supervisory or senior or supervisory lead roles, it, it can be fairly well compensated. Uh, one of the best ways of making more money is, well, first, you know, you have to be solid in your skills. You know, you first have to get into the studios and be able to get a job there. If you are, if you're negotiating as a student and you, the, the studio isn't even sure if they want you yet, you're not standing on a, on a particularly strong footing. But after a few years, once you've been in the field for a few years and you want to more pursue uh, the money game, then um, one of the honestly best ways of getting more money is to get to another studio. If you're, if you're staying at the same studio for, for several years, you're probably just gonna have a regular pay increase in line with maybe inflation, maybe you're gonna get like a 6% increase or whatever it is. But your main negotiation when you are negotiating is, or the main pay rise you're happening is during the initial negotiations of your salary when you are joining the studio. So you can dramatically increase your rates by leaving the studio, which kind of sucks because you, you might really enjoy the people there and the environment and the work again. But um, you can, you can particularly after a few years if you, you've been in a studio, uh, you might be severely underpaid for the work you're doing just because they've just been giving you annual bumps up. So yeah, uh, leave the studio and uh, if they are um, if, if they are uh, interested in keeping you they might they might counter the offer and they go from there to be fair though and long short i think a lot of people think that um, by going to vfx you'll be the starving artist you really not vfx can pay well yeah yeah yeah, yeah like the whole starving artist thing is I, I find that a lot of people who are struggling are the people who are maybe the loudest voices and there were you know the junior rates are rough that's just the way it is you're you're not doing particularly well when you're when you're in the first maybe two years uh, of your work but then it can be quite comfortable but you're you're in you know even if though you're in a big city you know unless you have a big family and your your your, your partner isn't isn't working on in in unless you, you're in that situation, it's, it's reasonably well compensated. You're not gonna be in a starving artist position. What is more scary though, isn't so much the salary per se, it's more, it can be more the job stability, where yeah. you might have to switch jobs quite, quite regularly. Yeah, I think that's actually more annoying than It is. But that, that also means that you, you know, if you, if, again, if it's not a corona <laughs> pandemic, then, uh, most likely you can jump from studio to studio, yeah. but uh, yeah, it can be a bit rough to have to move all the time as well. The VFX industry is, the, is pretty small, so the moment you get your name in there, it's, you know, people, we, we all tend to kind of know each other, so, yeah. you know, start to know people and it's not as rough. The first job is the hardest, basically. Yeah, I find that as well. Uh, after a while, then your name just kind of spreads and you're, you'll you be coasting a bit on reputation. When I went from MPC to DNIC, I, I didn't even have a showreel with my professional work. Uh, they weren't really that interested in it, just because at that point, uh, they knew that if you're professionally, you're at a professional level that you can work in one of the studios, you can most likely work at the other studios as well. Are hard surface designers big in demand? I, I don't know that one. That's, that's a good question. I would assume that if you're really good at hard surface, uh, there's gonna be a demand for you, but you want to be careful of not being too specialized uh, because you there are only so many giant mech robots which need to be built each year. So uh, I, I recommend that you, even if you want to focus on hard surface, you that you diversify a little bit at least. I think from what I've seen with friends of mine, I think hard surface can be a bit hard if it's too hard surface, if that makes yeah. sense. It doesn't need to be character work, but you should at least be able to maybe sculpt some rocks, you know, do some more organic shapes in in a ZBrush as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Um, Marcin is ask, uh, asking, why are you streaming instead of working in some studio? Yeah, I mean, I uh, I work more both Morton and I. We work full time on flip models and uh, really enjoy that. So uh, I mean, we used to, but uh, now we do full time flip models. We feel that this is where you can, uh, we, where we can really make a big difference. It's um, you can definitely make a difference in the effects as well. Like you can inspire a lot of people in a sense, but uh, it's it's just not the same as when when you can actually talk directly to people and you can hopefully share some of the things we learned along the way and we'll continue to learn as well. Just a little reminder as well that for people who just joined that we do have our Black Friday sale ongoing currently, 50% off everything on uh, on our marketplace. But we have a lot of really cool products like um, the ultimate bundle for 3D artists, or for beginners. This is where you, you this is really help, helpful if you want to get started with them, where I'm pretty sure I've made most of of these guys here <laughs> over the last few years. So I personally like all these, but I'm a little bit biased there. The most recent one is Intro Sculpting, which covers essentially everything I'm talking about in this stream, just way more in depth. And when you get to learn how to sculpt one of these guys from scratch, here we're using, um, from, from a sphere, using the same approach as in this one, and just going from there to there in around five hours real time. Uh, architect is asking, uh, what did you do on King Arthur? Oh yeah, what did I do on King Arthur? Oh, I worked on a few different things. There was one of these movies where I was supposed to get to the next big asset here and there, and then it just got shuffled around and different studios got different things. Uh, we were supposed to get a lot more creatures, but then apparently Framestore stole a lot of them. <laughs> so uh, we ended up doing different things. I worked a little bit on some of the sirens which were there in, in the waters. And then I worked on uh, textures for one of the, for the eagle, which was flying around there as well. One of the few times I actually worked on fur textures. And I worked on some environment stuff as well, I believe. It wasn't a crazy big show for me. And I haven't really watched the whole movie yet. <laughs> I tried it, but it's not a particularly good movie, <laughs> fortunately. Mm. Oh, somebody's asking my question. Oh, you should answer the question. Then. How can it be independent in the 3D world and will I, will it take a lifetime? I'm not sure what you mean by independent, to be honest. What do you think he means? Uh, yeah, I don't know. He will have, he will have to clarify. Uh, or he or she will have to clarify. Mr. Finery, if you clarify, maybe I can try to answer your question. Um, I'll be checking the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to make it his abs a little bit less round now, making them a little bit less bulgy because it's crazy bulgy. Nobody really has abs like that. So I want to preserve some of the overall curvature, like off his belly, like so it, it's a bit more out like this because I think that's cool. Um, but I don't want to. I don't want each specific like pack in his like massive eight pack to be crazy pronounced. Okay, what Mr. Finder means, earn your money by selling your models, making tutorials and so on. Um, this but is something you did more than I have to be Yeah, sure. that depends entirely on what you're selling. Uh, honestly, yeah. like it's, uh, you, can't just, you can't just go, oh, I want to make tutorials and, uh, and sell them or make, make models and sell them. It, it, you can have people who are, who are doing that, who are doing phenomenally well, and you have people who's doing that and they're not selling anything. It depends on the presentation of the tutorial. It depends on what the tutorial is about, how, how good you are, your reputation in that area. Uh, so yeah, like there isn't like a standard answer for that, unfortunately. I would say if you want to check somebody that I think has done a pretty good job at that, Travis Davids yeah. is a person that, uh, as far as I know, is mostly doing that. that. Basically, he found an audience. He's working, as far as I know, most of marvelous designers. Some of uh, his stuff is also on Flip Normals, I think. Yeah. And he slowly built his audience, and and he slowly started. I'm gonna guess that he tried to uh, see what people need, and he did what he, what they need. But it takes time. I, I don't Travis, think it's. I can't spell it all. Yeah, there he is. There it is. So Travis is Travis is doing really cool work. 
So he has a lot of cool tutorials, some marvelous, he has some fabric packs, he has some really cool like roughness materials. I need to just close down Slack. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, personal notification on the screen. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> I am just gonna kill that right away. Um yeah, I'll continue on what we were saying. Um what were you saying? I got uh, Travis slide. Davids. Oh yeah. Um yeah, he it, it I'm not I don't think it's impossible, it just takes time. Uh but it well, I think what you have to learn then a little bit that is not just doing whatever projects you just enjoy doing, you kind of have to learn what people want to buy, if that makes sense. Because I've, I've sold my, my drawings before, I've, I've done commissions yeah. before, I've, I've worked on a marketplace before, you'd be surprised from what people want sometimes. Yeah. That you kind of become, you have to become your own brand if you're going to do that. It takes time, it takes hard work, but if you keep working, I think it's possible. No, it's it's hundred percent yeah. possible. That Morton and yeah. I did that when we yeah. were in VFX as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's 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 a lot of hard work. Yeah. Uh, so a nice question. Really. There was a question there. The, yeah. Let's just scroll up a little. Uh, oh. I hope that helped, by the way. Um, I'm sure it did. So my process is kind of like make his make him super beefy and refined, and then we'll go over like this and like remove a lot of it and balance it all out. Like he's not gonna be like this later on at all. He's gonna be more like this where he has like a more natural fat percentage. Mm -hmm. Oh, Martin you earlier asked, can you be too old to learn 3D and get a job in the industry? No. Yeah. I mean, unless you physically can't do 3D anymore, unless you're to the point where like. You're, you know, like if you're, you're not, if you're not physically able to do it, then, then maybe, yeah. But unless you, you have some kind of like actual risk, like there is a medical reason for it, then, then no, uh, this is a, this is a field which, which requires a simple computer. I mean, not a simple, it requires an adequate gaming computer to work with. And then from there on you, you can, you can, most people can do it. The tutorials available online today are much better than, than they were before. They are much easier to find through YouTube. Uh, you can get essentially a full on university degree through through YouTube or very cheap tutorials. So like a hundred percent you can you can learn 3D like regardless of your age. Like I, I see this question a lot and a lot of, I know a lot of people are afraid of it, but but really if you want to do 3D, you can a hundred percent do it. I've seen people from all ages learn 3D from really young to to fairly advanced in their age. It's um, no, no, no. I, I, anyone can do this. If it helps, I remember in Framestorm, it's so many people that were chef, like worked in restaurants before. I don't know why, but <laughs> I, I swear I, had, I knew at least three guys that I worked with that were in their 30s and they were working at restaurants before, and they were like, I don't want to do this anymore. I mm -hmm. want to be in CG. And they were modelers in film frame store, so That's pretty cool. I'm sure that didn't stop them. I'm not saying the 30 is the age where you stop. Yeah, after 30, sorry, then yeah. that, was, that was a limit. <laughs> um, Steve is asking, uh, how do you find ZBrush links with physical clay sculpting? Yeah, I don't really know. I don't do physical clay sculpting, so <laughs> I'm a terrible person to ask that. Uh, how do you think it? In comparison, because you know you you do more, you've done a little bit more of that than I have. Dave Yam also asked if uh, clay sculpting helps with modeling. I mean, I've done it recently myself. I've taken a few classes on a few heads mm. with real clay. It pers I think I think it's different, but I think it, it definitely translates. I feel like a very good traditional sculptor if they picked up zebra, so would kick all of our asses yeah. in like. Probably yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, it, it would be uh, it would be embarrassing how fast a true proper traditional sculptor would completely annihilate me in, in anything. I would be able to get to a like if if we're like on a on a timer, and we had like an hour to do a sculpt, I would I would do quite well against them there. But if we had like more than like like a few days to do a sculpt, they would completely destroy <laughs> me. Like like no dis dispute even just because it's. They would just know sculpture on a on a more fundamental level to a much much higher level than I do. Yeah, because that's uh, what they do. 
but uh, I've tried it. They've helped me personally, just holding real clay and having a teacher explain things on a head. You know, I was making a head that was life-sized. Just helped a lot. Yeah. I think the one tip that was given to me then that helped me the most was when we were drawing. She said the. Um, uh, she said that the it should look like a human you would see on the street. She said if you go on the tube, if the, you saw this sculpt, you should it should look like any other guy. Mm -hmm. And that kind of clicked. If that makes sense. It's like would you see a person with chicks like that on the street? Yeah, kind of like that. If it's not a creature, of course. But yeah, like this guy here, you yeah. see him every day on on the street. <laughs> <and> <laughs> it's just doing some clay sculpting. Huh? We don't have any clay. Might be fun if you find it. Yeah. <laughs> Other than cinematography and directing, voice actors said, "What does it take to make your own short?" Well, if you're going to be doing that yourself, you need to you need to have a pretty decent overview of the pipeline. Just what are the different departments there? Like, what can you do yourself? Do you need a specialist rigger? A lot of times, you have generalists who can do most things themselves. Like, including LP and myself here, we we were pretty pretty decent generalists. Not like the best in the world, but you know, we could work on a short film and do most things. What what I think we'll be able to do would be like general layout, some cinematography, all the modeling, um, all the texturing, all the shading, not the rigging, not the animation, but probably lighting and a comp for that. But uh, I would I would very, very much need help from a lighter, oh, for, sorry, from a rigger and an animator if I were to do my own short movie. Those, those skills are just highly specialized and I find them to be yeah, I, I find it to be very diminishing returns doing it myself, just because you, if you're, when you're doing animation, you're doing acting. Uh, and it, it's like trying to hire a plumber to do acting. You just want to have an actor for it. It is a very specialized skill and just, just respect that skill and uh, get somebody proper to do it. If you don't have a good rigor, you can't, you won't have good animation because they're going to be struggling with the rig throughout. And if you don't have good animation, you don't have good acting. I fear that, uh, I fear to look for jobs because even though I feel like my art is good enough to look for a job, it might be too soon. Plus my background is in tech and not in art school. Well, if you're in tech, then at least if you if you have some knowledge in programming, that's going to help you drastically in terms of um, in terms of uh, 3D. There will always that will, that will just always help you. But uh, I mean, if it's too soon, then then I mean, you just you just got to try it out. Uh, you won't know if it's too soon if unless you try it out. There's no like perfect moment. The thing is, when you start at a company, you're always going to feel overwhelmed. You're going to be like, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> There's so much to learn and there are so many new skills and so many new people to meet and all that. So at some point, you just got to go for it. If you feel you're ready, start applying, man. Just start, just get into it and start applying. Before though, just make sure that you are actually ready. Like, make sure that you have somebody you can trust and actually have a quick look at your portfolio. Uh, this can be a professional in your field. Uh, you can maybe even message them on LinkedIn or ArtStation, send them a nice, polite message where essentially they can answer a yes or no question. For instance, if somebody asked me that, um, they, I, would, I would be able to answer them yes or no. Essentially, is my portfolio ready for the industry to search for, to go for a 3D modeler position in film? It would be quite easy to go uh, yes or no. And if it's no, then, then you know, figure out why. If yes, then do it and go for it. To be fair, when I applied for Framestore, I, I applied for my first job. It was, I got the internship. I didn't think that there was a way I would get it, so mm. I just tried it. And yeah. then I th was ready to go home, but I somehow got it. But it worked out, so somehow might as well just try. It was so weird of me. It was almost <laughs> like you, you knew what you were doing or something. It was really weird. I really thought I didn't know, though. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's always this thing, right? Like with artists and securities, you just have to try it. You have to, at some point, it is a leap of faith. It was the same when Morton and I quit our jobs as well in VFX uh, to do flip normals. We knew some of the math made sense, but you know, you just have to take a leap of faith. Yeah.
Can you recommend any books about the industry and art making or life as an artist in general? It's kind of tricky to find that because there aren't really a whole lot of books on like on this subject in terms of the effects, but I believe you have one. Let me see if I remember this. Creativity Inc. I believe this is a pretty good book by Ed, Ed Catmull, basically the guy who made Pixar and the Catmull Clark algorithm. I've heard good things about this one. No, have not read it myself. Yay, more science. <laughs> but apparently this is, a, this is a good book about creativity. Um, overcoming the unseen forces that stand in the way of true inspiration. If anyone has seen, has read this book, please uh, leave a super quick review in, in the comments. Uh, but that, I haven't seen a lot of books about creativity itself in the 3D industry. I found, uh, when it comes to just becoming a better, better artist, I found The Color and Light by Gurney. Yeah. Uh, generally the Gurney books, I think they, but that's more, it wasn't really modeling, that's for, oh, there's a phone ringing, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I've been had to run, her alarm was ringing. <laughs> hey, thanks Ethan. Oh uh, yeah, we are uh, very much, <laughs> we're doing okay now, thank you so much. Nicol Nicholas is asking an interesting question. I've been working on a cool, challenging character concept for a few weeks, still in the blocking stage. Recently found somebody who's already done a really solid work version of this concept. What now? I mean, keep on going, I suppose. Unless, it, you know, well, I mean, yeah, just keep on going. You, you might learn a lot from it. Um, if the other person beat you to it, well, just try it yourself. And enjoy yourself. See if... See if you can do it yourself as well. Maybe you can learn something from that person as well. Entism sculpting ice with ZBrush. Ooh, interesting one. Uh, first, like with anything, get reference. You just have to get reference of what ice looks like. Uh, then I would recommend using H polish. H polish is amazing. That's this guy here. And this allows you to really quickly get these like nice sharp lines like this. H polish along with the trim dynamic is going to really improve your life when it comes to these kind of like hard surfacey models like this. You can just really quickly go in and just you know add these really sharp lines. I tend to actually use this a fair bit when I'm doing character sculpting as well, just to get the planes right. It's really important to get the planes right, at least early on. Well, at least at any stage, but particularly early on. Stergos is saying that he's working on the Sculpt November uh, um, challenge as well. That's, I mean, that's kind of what that's you're cool. doing. Yeah, that's what I'm doing as well. Yeah. Good job, brother. <laughs> Your name sounds very Greek, by the way. If you're any Greek, whoop, whoop. Mm -hmm. Okay. If not, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> Fat stop. Good job, Hen. <laughs> Thank you. Peter is trying to teach me Greek. Uh, it's not going super well. Thank you, Wo. That's that's really kind of you. Uh, for the people that don't know about Sculpt November, we have a challenge where you do a sculpt each week. This week is the last week. Uh, the theme is ancient for this week. You do anything you want. You, all, you, all, you just have to sculpt. You don't have to do anything else. If you do more things, do it so that you learn more. That's up to you. And just post it online with the hashtag sculpt November, tag flip normals, and we'll find it. And the winner is getting what is the winner again? The winner is getting a free Flip Normals product uh, of your choice as long as it's in a Flip Normals exclusive and is not a bundle nor a commercial license. Yep. Approximately. But yeah, do it if, if you feel like sculpting this week and you want to run the challenge, you can join us. Yeah, it's, it's a really fun one. Uh, I'm having a lot of fun. Obviously, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to win it because I'm, I'm a judge and that would be a bit bad. <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that would be the most corrupt Flip Normals challenge in history of 
challenges. I mean, what would you win? You would win your own tutorials. Yeah, but maybe I've forgotten it. It's <laughs> it's pretty interesting, right? It happens so often. It's embarrassing. Where I'm I'm googling something and I'm like, how to use the collection? How to use how to use collections in Blender or something? I'm like, oh man, I can't remember this. And then it's like, hey, this is Henning and Morton from Flipmodels. In this video, we're gonna talk about how collections work. And it's like, god damn it. <laughs> I just owned myself. It's so weird that I can't even remember making those videos and now I'm learning from my past self. Like it's it's actually it's actually weird. That, like you know hearing yourself speak to your present day self. And sometimes the weirdest thing is like, oh man, I never knew that. That was such a good tip. <laughs> and it's like, wait, what are you talking about? I'm literally saying the tip in this <laughs> in this video. It's absurd when you're you're starting to realize how quickly you forget things. Mm. It's also a thing with tutorials as well. Like this is a little little secret, a little normal secret. But when you're doing a tutorial, like when you're making a tutorial, you don't you don't possess that knowledge in your brain forever. You first off you prep before the video. When you, for instance, you're making an introduction to uh, to Maya, you may not know what every single feature is doing just from the bottom of your heart. At some point, you know, you might be wondering what actually is a path tracer or what, how exactly are the samples working or what is a hotkey for this thing? And you have notes. It's like if you're preparing a real world lecture, you have notes and you're preparing for that. And then once the lecture is done, you know, you're not gonna remember everything for all of eternity. So that, that's always the weird thing as well when people assume that I know all the things like, no, 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 it's a video I made two years ago. I can barely remember making the video. <laughs> I mean, we had, look, we have 300 videos now on the channel. You're not going to remember every single one of them just from the top of your head. I just had this like a few weeks ago, actually, I was, I was thinking about new videos we could make. And uh, all the ideas I had was something we did around three years ago on the channel. It's like, damn it. <laughs> like it was almost exactly the same topic as well. Is your sculpt still dynamish? Yes, it is. Uh, sculpt is still dynamish. I'll probably keep it dynamish for a very long time. Uh, I don't see any reason to go out of dynamish at this at this moment. One thing you might notice as well, which is kind of a bit different, I guess, is that I'm using a very low intensity with the clay buildup brush. I have it set to seven, and I'm not using any alphas, which means I'm I'm able to really control the surfaces. I'm not using the smooth brush or anything. Like when I'm refining the shapes for different areas now, I'm straight up just using. Uh, just working on top of it uh, like this. If I want to soften this line out, I'm not just going over it with uh, uh, with a smooth brush. I'm working over it with a low intensity clay builder brush. This gives me really, really fine control. CJ Cat is asking, how do you break up the skin surface to not look flat before adding alphas? That's a great question. Actually, that's something I'm kind of doing now. You can you can set the seed intensity quite low on the brush. And then if, if this is the main direction of the muscle, then I'll try to work across the shapes. I'll work like this, across the shape. So let me show you. If I need to break this shape here up, like I'm, I'm just looking at the Ar Arnold here and you, you, you don't necessarily have it as, as a super clean differentiation. So then I'm, I'm working just on top of it like this. I'm just working over it and I'm just kind of trying to, to break the shape up just a little bit. This becomes more apparent when I'm looking at the face now, where I'm not really smoothing it out. Like let's do the forehead. Forehead is a bit more interesting because there's nothing here. If, if I'm working on top of this, I'm not just like sculpt, smooth, sculpt, smooth. I'm working just across the shape. I'm adding a little bit of volume. It's a very subtle way of working like this, a little bit of volume, a little bit more volume, and I'm working across the shape. I'm working like this. And then I just keep refining every single area of the model. You just go over it and you just refine and you're refining and you're refining and you think deliberately about mid frequency. So close to 200,000 subs. Yes, we are. Anything special planned? Uh, honestly, not right now. <laughs> we are hoping to do more streams in general. That'd be a lot of fun, but we don't, we don't really have anything crazy crazy plan for that. Morton and I are really bad at celebrating things. <laughs> when we hit like milestones, we're like, maybe we should do like a, maybe we should have like a Red Bull today. <laughs> and uh, and uh, 
we just get we just like no come on do something serious i mean like a really big red bull and like maybe some chips or something and like some wine no no, no something bigger red bull and wine <laughs> red bull and wine i'm sorry jesus christ then you have to die <laughs> <laughs> but Red Bull and Jägermeister on the other hand, that is that is fine, but that, not that wine. is great. Yeah, but not wine. No, 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 no. I no. apologize. Uh, I do like to make crepes, so that's something. <laughs> yeah, we can have celebratory crepes. Yeah. Is it good to be jack of all trades and 3D or really spread too thin? Good question. Um, we uh when it comes to it, you you i find it useful to be jack of some trades you don't necessarily want to be jack of all trades you don't necessarily want to want to know everything about everything if you want to be a master or be intermediate at houdini rendering in arnold using blender you're working with effects in houdini doing all these kind of things like then you are spreading yourself too thin but if you want to be at a point where well you want to be a generalist that's kind of jack of all trades, but you're you kind of like defining where your limits are. You're like maybe like okay, I don't touch animation. That is just not something this guy does. Uh, but you want to be careful. You want, do want to be deliberate about not spreading yourself too thin, because that can be pretty pretty catastrophic for you as well. Adrian is asking for a face review. We already had like face reveal for like two years now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of YouTube videos with Henning and Martin on them, so yeah. you can go see their faces. Guess who is who? <laughs> the one with the hair is uh, is not is not Henning. Well, depending on when depending you're watching it. Depends, because you have videos with you with hair. Yeah, there was a period before Alpida shaved me at the middle of the night where I had hair. Yeah. Good times. Good times. Fant and red wine is interesting. Yeah, it's not a bad one. I actually like to mix Sprite or 7-Up with white wine. Oh, interesting. I haven't tried that before. Yeah. My parents do it all the time. Huh. People think we're crazy, but yeah, it works. Yeah, I mean, whatever works for you, right? Mm. Hey, do you have any tips for sculpting horns? Yeah, that's that's um, uh, kinda. Let me try. I'll just save this guy first. So sculpting horns, what you can do, you can start from a sphere, and then we can turn this guy into polymesh. Then we can turn this guy into uh, into dynamesh. Just so we have some more resolution. Then what you can do, which is pretty cool, if we just enable uh, if we just enable um, uh, symmetry now in snake hook. Snake hook brush is amazing. The snake hook brush is essentially the horn brush. You can also enable this with the, with the Sculptus Pro mode, and then it's the horn brush on steroids, speaking of. <laughs> <laughs> so the cool thing about this is you can just make really cool horns right away. You can just drag them out like so and just go crazy. This is I really like this approach because it's so flexible. Little tip as well, if you smooth it out now, hey, you now have floating geometry in between and then once you have the general shapes you want then you can um, maybe you can just dynamesh the whole thing to get a bit cleaner topology it's like this you can smooth the whole thing down remove sculptors pro smooth it all down you can hit zero measure as well just to get some more clean topology like this almost there we go nice clean topology subdivide it and then we can hold down the alt key and then we can get these nice clean lines like so zoop we can get nice clean lines like here like zoop and then we can use something like h polish they keep changing the hotkeys for this which is a bit confusing and then we can go over it with h polish and we can just really get these nice clean planes like so and we kind of have some horns if you want to really like uh, make this sharp we can use the pinch brush and we can just like pinch it like so and if you want to make this feel more integrated with the head we can set this to have an alpha use the clay brushes clay build up and then we can just kind of sculpt around it like so and that's kind of how i make horns and first off you of course look at reference but that's like a mini tutorial on how to make horns 
And then you can have like some slight undulation like this. You can break up the main shapes. You can add some like striation to it and all that. Uh, but that's a that's a pretty quick way of making horns. Maybe mm -hmm. you should make a tutorial for that. Yeah. <laughs> Might also have another cool way of making horns. Could there be a creature kit? No, oh. there is no such, maybe there is <laughs> horns. Yeah, I think I might try that. Let's see that. Load brush, horn, horn man. I have so many weird things. Um, where could this be? Anyway, uh, you can also make a VDM brush as well. So if you do want to make a horn, like a really cool horn, we have Let's see, the creature kit. The creature kit is awesome. It allows you to simply just drag out like a million horns in, in like in no time at all. Let's see, the creature kit. If the polygons are stretching at this level, then what do you do? Um, you can dynamesh it. Uh, again, you can dynamesh it, and you can reproject it and all that. Cool thing about this is this horn is fully just made in VDM. This in this guy here, let me show you another picture of this. Here he's made essentially entirely with VDM brushes. It's like a soft little blob, but with the eyes are from here, the eye ears are from here, this is the base mesh, mouth is from here, fur is from here, this nose is from here, horn is from there, and little pimples are from here. So this little guy can this this little kit can really just help you create these kind of things super quickly. Marwan is asking, um, uh, it says, um, new sculpting and transition, transitioning from poly modeling. Do you have any tips uh, that are overlooked uh, from beginners like myself? In the meantime, I'm going to link the creature kit in a second. Yeah, uh, any tips you're going for poly modeling? Uh, if, you're, if you've been only doing poly modeling, then I recommend learning, learning sculpting. Like just, just learn ZBrush. Just commit fully to learning ZBrush. Uh, you don't like it's not not saying that you should abandon poly modeling poly modeling is phenomenal from like for something like prop modeling it's much better for that than zbrush i find but it's it's really useful to just embrace zbrush embrace zbrush properly as a tool so learn zbrush we have a really good tutorial on that well i'm a bit biased again i i made it but i tried i did my best i tried my best to make a really cool series but here's intro to zbrush this is a um, series where you can just learn how to get started with ZBrush. Once you have once you have that, then you can check out Intro to Sculpting. And from here, you can learn how to sculpt. So these two together work really well. And they're both 50% off right now, so they're exactly 20 bucks. So first, Intro to ZBrush to learn ZBrush, and then Intro to Sculpt to learn the fundamentals of it. And I'm just trying to look at Arnold and just seeing what I can do to make my guy look a bit more like Arnold. Uh, people are asking about your personal projects generally. Do you want to talk about how much you have time for personal projects? What do you do? So yeah, I, I don't really have a lot of time for personal projects. <laughs> I haven't had time in a few years. Uh, and the reason is is because of uh, flip -ons. It just takes a lot of time. But I can show you. Here's one little thing I'm working on. This is actually for like a masterclass thing as well I'm doing, uh, which I would love to make a full tutorial on this. Let's see if I have some renders for this guy. It is here somewhere. Nice. Okay, so here's uh, here's the thing we worked on for we worked on uh, recently, where um, making this guy um, from from scratch in ZBrush, same as same as before, just. Uh, same as in intro to um, to sculpting, modeling up from scratch. The difference is that this is taken to a more final point, where um, where uh, he's textured in Mari, he's sculpted properly in ZBrush. There's like nice action for him. There's nice groom and fur and everything on there. Uh, and then we're using the um, Flipnum's eye kit for the eyes as well. So I do a little bit of it, but not a not a whole not a whole lot these days. And speaking of that, let me show you. This is this is a really cool thing. Um, 
This is something that I don't think a lot of people know exists. This is the eye kit, which came out just a few weeks ago, which I personally think is a really, really cool one. This is um, made by a real talented artist called Farid Nagy, and um, it works in all in all engines. Essentially, drag and drop it in, and you just have really nice eyes right away. This is for that as well, same guy as before. Where you can, this is how close it works. This is uh, Morton doing a render in cycles, and it looks like this weird BBC shot. But yeah, this is how close up it actually works. So it works, it works from mega close up to really, really far away. So this is like a realistic view of how it works. Essentially, drag and drop it into your scenes, into Marmoset, into any game project. It works with everything there. So uh, that's something I'm using a lot for the, um, uh, for my eyes, at least for personal projects. So if I were to take this guy further, I would probably use the eye kit for this guy. Just want to let people know about that because I don't think people know that we have the eye kit. 50% um, off right now. It's it's just like drag and drop and you have full on realistic eyes. And any other, any other interesting questions, Sophia? Mm. Sorry, I'm sculpting now when Alpida is going through <laughs> some things. James Wills is asking, is my or substance better? Yeah, it depends entirely on what you're doing. For it depends. Mari and Mari and Paint were made for two very different purposes. Mari was made with the aim of solving huge data sets being textured, where you know you need a hundred eight K maps and you just have to texture that. It's for like a character like this, and you're gonna have a shot which is like here. You can't do that in Painter, at least not as far as I know. It would just destroy your computer and it would be so heavy. So if you need a close up, like which is like here, you just basically need Mari. But if you need like a shot of like this area, it might be a lot quicker in Mari, because, or it's in Painter. Because Painter was made with the goal of making texturing fun and easy and really quick to do. So when you need the highest, highest quality, Mari will will just do a really good job, particularly for organics. Uh, but for it doesn't have as, as good smart material support, and it's a lot slower in the sense that you don't really get a whole lot for free. Well, in in Painter, you get a lot of stuff for free. There's a lot of cool procedurals already pre-built. You have you just have much better smart material support, and in general, you just have a better ecosystem for that. So they're solving different things. It's not like either or. It's more like, yes, thank you, I like both. Omen is asking tips on how, for how to sculpt teeth. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, we have our friend <laughs> of ours. <laughs> this is actually a different one. I, I don't think, I've only, whenever I had to model teeth, I usually found a base mesh and then made it match whatever I wanted to Yeah, do. check this guy out. Yeah. This, is, this is the guy who made the eye kit. And, um, and it's he's, available on Flip Normals as well. God damn, why am I, why am I showing this on yeah. the wrong site then? He's like, what are your nice <laughs> Okay, I'm going to show this on non-flip normals then. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would recommend using proper reference for this. Like in this case, look for one of the existing teeth. There in this is. case, here we go. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Look at something which is already been made and try to replicate that. It's a really good idea to look, looking at something which exists like this because this way you have some good reference. It's hard to find good references for something like teeth. And there's also a crazy amount of individual variation when it comes to teeth as well. So when it comes to it, I separate them out in two or three parts, uh, or sorry, three or four parts. Uh, you have the top, let me draw. I'll, I'll try to not log out this time as well. You have a few pieces. We have um, this piece here, which is the first piece. This is the this is this is where the, the the gums are for the top one. All of this is piece one. Then you have piece two, which are the lower gums as well. You want to have this as a separate piece. Then you have piece three, which would be the tongue. The tongue could be attached to the mouth in general to the remaining base mesh, or it could be separate. It doesn't necessarily matter a whole lot because. You, you know, if you can have a shot from the inside of the mouth, uh, yes, but in general, you're probably fine. So that's one, two, three, and then we have uh, the top teeth and we have the bottom teeth. And here you want every single tooth to be separate and unique. 
You can have the same topology, but you really want to make the shape unique for each tooth. So build first the gums, the, the bottom gums and, and this, and then you model each tooth and you really spend a lot of time making the teeth proper. That would be my suggestion for modeling, for modeling teeth. Any suggestion for beginners? Where do you get free content to guide me? Yes, I do. Now, I'm not doing as much sculpting as I would like to. But if we go to YouTube, and maybe we have flip normals here somewhere. If you go to YouTube, then, um, and we search for, hey, here we are, flip normals, nice. We have a significant amount of free tutorials on different things. So if you want to learn ZBrush, we have a whole playlist on ZBrush. If you want to learn Maya, we have a whole playlist on Maya. We have a bunch of different things here. So uh, check out our YouTube video, our YouTube channel. We have a lot of free content there. Uh, for instance, we have a free one hour introduction to, to Maya, which came out not too long ago. We have the same for ZBrush, we have the same for Mari, we have, we have that for, for uh, Painter, a few different software. So if you want good free content, like our YouTube is, is actually a, a, good, a really good resource for that. And there's also the YouTube channel Fluid Normals Marketplace where you release yeah. free chapters from exclusive tutorials. That's that's a really nice one as well. It's just called Fluid Normals Marketplace and uh, uh, it's a much smaller channel, but it means it's where we are doing free chapters and such. Lizzie is asking, uh, paraphrasing here, if it's cheating to use the VDM uh, brushes like the Creature Kit. Yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's a bit like, is it cheating to use a base mesh or is it cheating to use a scan. Uh, it depends what you're doing. If you're going in as a concept artist and uh, and you're showing that off, they're like, awesome. You were able to come up with cool ideas in no time at all, and we can use this. If you're going in as a modeler though, and they're like, oh, so you just use a bunch of like arm brushes and teeth brushes and horn brushes, and the only thing you did is kind of kit bashed it, that might not be the greatest. But if you're doing, if you're doing, um, if you're doing pure concepting, then like just anything goes, just whatever may get you to the result. But if you're doing particularly more junior work, I highly recommend you to you know, get familiar with VDM brushes, use them for personal projects and such, but for but know how to do it as well. That, that was what we talked about in today's video. If you haven't checked that, it's about like some of our coolest hacks we know, we know in CG. And um, you need to not, you need to not rely on the hacks. You need to, you need to understand how to do sculpting uh, without using crazy hacks. How do you gather your reference? Do you have any sources you could share? I mean, all my reference comes from Google. It's just I'm googling specific things. So for this, I was googling bullhead model, and then it was bullhead, and then it was. Um, uh, some classical anatomy sculpture. So uh, here it was bodybuilder. So I mean, I'm not I'm not that sophisticated when it comes to my reference in terms of this. Uh, it is it is just more like simple and simple and elegant uh, googling for reference. No like magic bullet for this. A lot of people seem to like uh, Pinterest as well for that. For, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question. How do you, how do you, um, um, how profitable do you think sculpting figures for 3D printing would be? I would love to make a quick buck for practice sculpts, but I'm not sure how worth it would be. Yeah, as a, as a general matter, I, I find that the thing of a quick buck doesn't really exist. You, you might be able to get freelance, but I find that it commit to, to the jobs and, and, it, and and assume it's going to be a lot of work. Otherwise, it's just gonna it's just gonna end up biting in the butt. Uh, I honestly have no idea about the collectible market. Like I, I can't say anything for or against that. I I, I know it's a growing market. Uh, also, you know, with the rise of three D printing. But um, I want to be really careful about talking about things I, I don't really know that well.
So I'm just working all over the model now, just in a few different places and just focusing on a few different things, really. Not really a clear focus, more just like looking at it and seeing what can I improve. The legs need some improvement, so I'm trying to just look at Mr. Arnold and, uh, and uh, trying to get that into my model. Arnold had such a ridiculous body, just crazy that anyone, even, anyone can even look like this. Like it's weird to assume that we're actually the same species as uh, as this guy. Maybe we're not. Maybe we're not. That would explain a few things. Have you dealt with any AR VR projects? Nope. <laughs> Have you done that, Rupia? Any mm. VR? Anything like that? No, no, actually no. That is an emerging market, though. That sounds like a really fun thing to work on. But I haven't touched. I haven't really touched most most things outside of like some commercials and and a fair bit of film, mm. and just general three D projects. But like that's that's the area where I which I know by far the best. Definitely growing, but no. Yeah. How do you know if you have too many polys for the level you're currently at? Well, if you can go, can you go down one subdivision level and nothing changes? If so, then you have too many polys. Uh, you should you should really only add more subdivision and more resolution to your model if you are at a point where you you actually can't get more refinement at the current level. Um, so yeah, if you have um, if you can go down one level and uh, it looks the same then you have too many polys. Well, hello from the Philippines. We are saying hi right back to you from Denmark. Whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. Representing. <laughs> just trying to get the knees right. The knees are just tricky. It's just hard to get knees right. It is. It's hard to get legs right. There's a lot of character in them. Hello from Argentina, nice. Where are you guys all from? Good day from Australia. It's not the furthest away from us. Yeah, I mean, uh, pretty furthest would probably be New Zealand. Okay. That would be almost on the other side. Any tips on hands? Yes, I do. That, I actually have a really good tips on hands. This is going to sound crazy stupid when it comes to hands, but look at your own hands. Like seriously, like I see so many people, they're struggling with drawing hands and sculpting hands and all that. And then they haven't looked at their own hands. Look at your own hands when, when, when sculpting. Just take some photos of it or just straight up observe it. Like if I'm sculpting, I'm scold I'm right-handed, so I'm I'm looking at. I would be working on uh, uh, this. This would be the left hand. So at this point, I would just be looking at my left hand and then sculpting the left hand at the same time. And due to the magic of symmetry, the right hand would be updated at the same time. So yeah, <laughs> make sure to look at your own hand and uh, go from there. So many people from so many countries. Wow, it's so cool to see where people are from. I really like it. Yay, from Norway. <laughs> so weird, I was gonna say something in Norwegian, but I realized I don't really speak Norwegian anymore, so I was gonna have to stop myself. <laughs> <laughs> you should say something. <laughs> I haven't spoken Norwegian in such a long time. <laughs> it's embarrassing. You know, like being born and native and everything there, it's just uh, Hello, it's Emil. Oh, hi, Emil. Hello, Emil. Yay, more from Denmark. Yeah, we're currently in Copenhagen. <laughs> they want me to say something in Norwegian. All right, as I can't snack a little bit, but it's a little bit of 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 <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought it'll be that the most simple things. <laughs> That's it's also weird because I have a I have the weird Norwegian accent. I'm, I have from, I'm from from Bergen. That was Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so 
somebody picked up your accent though. Yeah. Yeah, I'm from Bergen. The rainiest city ever. In Bergen last week, it rained more than it does in Copenhagen in two months. <laughs> so that was, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah, and that's why I don't speak Norwegian a whole lot. It's it's weird. The weirdest thing with Norwegian is when I have to do anything like official with the government, and it sounds like like I haven't really written Norwegian in ten years, and it's weird. I actually ask my friends for help sometimes with break now, so like. Eh. How do you get good, how do you get clean topology for a sculpt? I use Dynamesh and Primitives, but artifacts want to subdivide. Yeah, this is actually a pretty good one. I still have this guy from before. So let's say this guy is completely messed up, right? Like we can uh, delete lower and then we can just Dynamesh it. And now we have completely messed up topology. What you can do, a little mini tutorial for you. I'll just remove these half naked boys. Uh, so we have something else to look at. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want clean topology on this, what you can do, a little bit not great, but it's fine. Duplicate it, then you hit the see or measure button, which uh, you can't see because it's under the little banner, little 50% banner, yay. And then we go to geometry, uh, we go to see or measure and we hit see or measure. And now you are going to see in about a few seconds that we have nice and clean topology. Nice. Then we subdivide it a few times, control D. You see we can go up and down and then we can go to subtool project and then we're going to project all and there we go now we have good clean topology from zero meshing along with um, all the details we had from the old model this is how i would do it for for this as well if i was taking this further for like for posing or something like that like not for serious sculpting then i would retop it properly by hand or i would use an existing base mesh and use wrap 3 on it but for this you can just hit um you can just hit uh sear mesh and reproject the details ed winter is asking how are we doing oh hey ed i hope you're doing hope you're doing all right hope uh i hope uh, mexico is, is treating you all right I met Ed a few years ago back in London, along with Vimal. It was really nice. Mm, nice. Yeah, this is life. Um, how do you get inspiration? That is a good question. Uh, what inspires me a lot is, for sculpture at least, is the, 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 it's a lot of cool stuff like on ArtStation and Seabar Central and all that. But looking at uh, classical sculptors, there is, uh, there, is a, um, there is a sculpture gallery here in Copenhagen actually called Glyptoteke, I think it is. And it's just like a collection of, of absolutely phenomenal sculptures. Going in there into like the French department and just seeing like 18th, 19th century French sculptures is just completely mind-blowing. It's where you just get taken to school, you know, been working on cool things for movies and you've been sculpting for so many years. And then there is a dead French guy who's been gone for 200 years and he just, he just owned you. And that is amazing. <laughs> uh, Selena is asking how to sculpt the armpit area when using Dynamesh. I always get artifacts. It's just so tricky. Yeah, one of the ways you want to sculpt the armpit is specifically with Dynamesh is you want to have high enough resolution. It's the same with the fingers as well. You notice that my fingers are not blended together as one mush. And that's because I always had high, a high enough Dynamesh resolution in order to make that not happen. The armpit is interesting because the armpit doesn't exist per se like you don't have like the armpit muscle or anything the armpit is kind of like a collection of it's like the negative space left behind from the pecs which are here from the biceps from the tricep from the brachio brachio brachialis which is here just forgot the name from these guys the serratus anterior and we have some of the other muscles it's kind of like what's left behind so it helps to understand what's actually going on here because if not then you're then you're kind of fighting it 
Right now, for instance, what I'm screwing up a little bit is that the bicep is it needs to go a bit more like this because it looks a little bit too like too thick in this area. It needs to have more of like an insertion point. So I need to go in and I need to just straight up carve in the bicep. Just be more deliberate with the bicep. And then like I'm not going to do this too much because it's on the inside and it's awkward as a hell to actually sculpt here. Then we need to get in the brachialis muscle. Just a quick little thing for that. Again, it's a bit awkward to see and you're not going to see it a whole lot. Maybe you can mask it. We can mask it, but I'm not going to no. bother too much with okay. it. Uh, it's a good idea. <laughs> I'm just not going to. Okay. And then up here, we're just going to force in an armpit and just be deliberate about it. Try to, if you, if you make all the muscles in the correct spot, you will just kind of get the armpit for free. Because again, the armpit doesn't exist. It's, it's the lack of something being there. Thanksgiving in the US, no? Yeah, I suppose. Right. Yeah, happy, happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Some yeah. People that celebrate, yeah. Yeah, I hope you have some delicious turkey with your family. Hey, Henning, do you have any new opinion on the Blender versus Seabrush debate, especially considering Blender's new multi res features in today's 291 update? I mean, it looks it looks great. It's, uh, it's getting there and it's getting a lot better, a lot faster. But I mean, the reality is just that Blender is just not taking over Seabrush as a sculpting tool. Like, like I don't see that really ever happening. I might have to eat my own words there at some point. But Seabrush is just really far ahead. Like, we're not like a point one update away from it taking over anything. Like the the refinement you have in the tools in Seabrush are like it's it's really well done. You have you have so many tools which work well together. Seabrush is a weird one. Like I'm not I'm not gonna say that Seabrush is the greatest thing in the world, but for pure sculpting, it is it is phenomenal. So I don't really see that as nothing is really changed there in that sense. You see a lot of cool tech demos, but then you try them out and you're like, okay, yeah, it still has some some time to go. Yeah, I really hope everyone is safe and um, safe for Thanksgiving as well. I know there's been a lot of a lot of problems with with uh, with people not being able to go back and see their family as well, which made it really sad seeing people celebrating that alone. I know that Thanksgiving in the US is basically bigger than Christmas for us here, so. Do you think it's a good idea to learn Blender for beginners to sculpt simple stylus characters, then later transition to ZBrush if you want to start make more realistic characters? I mean, the thing is, Blender isn't better than ZBrush for for stylized necessarily. I don't I don't think that's the case. You can make incredibly well done stylized characters in ZBrush. Use whatever tool you're comfortable with. If you prefer Blender, use that. If you prefer ZBrush, use that. Like. Like I, I really don't have really have a dog in, in this fight. Like I, I don't, I don't really care, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I'm only here to offer my opinion on on the current state of things. Uh, but like, what I, I've no, no, I'm no bone to pick with any one of those. If you want to use ZBrush or or you want to use Blender, do your thing. Just uh, whatever makes you happy, whatever whatever gets the job done. And right now for me, ZBrush gets the job done. Uh, but I mean that said, like if if there was a if there was a replacement for Seabrush tomorrow, I would be the first person to use that replacement. I have plenty of significant issues with Seabrush, so like I'm I'm not a fanboy of Seabrush at all. Like I, Seabrush and I, we have had our ups and downs. Let me tell you. James Chan is asking, is saying most big studios use Linux. Why has Pixel Logic not made a Linux version of ZBrush? I think that this is just my little theory. Could be wrong, but I think that ZBrush is made in such a crazy way that it's not possible to port it to Linux. Hmm. Could be wrong. Could also be that they generally don't care about the VFX environment in that sense. Um, but uh, it could just be that. I mean, ZBrush is from you know like the late 90s it is built using absolute black magic but uh i'm not sure if, if you if you can port it 
It's the same with like 3 Studio Max. As far as I know, Max is not on Linux either. Same with Photoshop. You don't have Photoshop on Linux. No. So, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe they just don't care. Maybe it's impossible to do. I mean, nobody really knows that apart from inside Pixel Logic. But yeah, like that was an interesting thing though when we were in, in VFX. It was like, well, you don't have you don't have ZBrush. No, no, we do. They just have to bring you a separate computer. <laughs> yeah, we had like a little switch. You yeah. Click through. And sometimes that little switch would break the drivers. <laughs> so you would just be raging all day long and you had to reboot all the time and ask tech to restart stuff. And it was, uh, it was not great. Yeah. Are there any new software you're excited to try? Actually, recently I've been using a Pilot iPad and I've been using a Nomad. Nomad sculpting is really cool. Um, it feels it's a it's a very simple software to use, but it's very powerful. Like it's not it's not there yet in terms of beating ZBrush, but you know, give it give it a little bit of time, and if it can have a desktop experience as well, very nice. No, what feels to me like uh, Procreate and Photoshop. Procreate doesn't have all the tools, but it's very compact and nice to just use on the go. Yeah. 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 No, I'm I'm very excited about about that. I mean, they they could. I could see it could happen that something like like Nomad could come in and eventually replace something like ZBrush. It's a dedicated tool. ZBrush is really powerful, but it's hard to use. And I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who they just want to sculpt. They just have no interest in all the and all the crazy features. Like look, if you hit the beak, you know, like look at all these brushes. <laughs> Let me just draw the brushes you actually need to use. Like the brushes you need, let's have a little green. Those are, you would need maybe the clay, the clay buildup. You would need the maybe polish, maybe trim adaptive, trim dynamic, C project, C modeler, tractor can be cool. Uh, nothing standard, you would need that. Um, damn standard. Mm, not a whole lot of this, <laughs> not a whole lot of that. <laughs> like there just isn't that much that useful when it comes to the actual brushes and ZBrush. You need that, you need move, move topological, uh, you need inflate. But like this, this is kind of what you need in ZBrush. If they were to make a, a version of ZBrush, which most of the other stuff was thrown out, I it would take me probably six months before I would notice because I don't, I just don't use those features. Like I'm not saying they're entirely useless because I'm sure there is a use case for them, but for the pure sculpting experience, it's it's a bit over-engineered and ZBrush is, is a bit of a weird, weird little one. When will you guys be starting streaming tomorrow? Actually, we, we don't know. Uh, we haven't we haven't discussed that in depth, but at, at some point, then then we'll probably just do like a proper, uh, like a nice little Q and A, like a more formal Q and A. We we'll just ask us all your questions, and we'll just be there. I don't think we'll be doing sculpting at that point, but just uh, just some fun, more relaxing Q and A for the big event tomorrow. I found, have you found a use for the cloth dynamics? Honestly, not a whole lot. I, I don't find them to be that useful. Did you get into rigging? Rigging is big and scary to me and I am not a rigger. <laughs> I've done a little bit of it here and there, but um, if I if I have to do rigging, I, I will do rely on auto riggers, like something like Advanced Skeleton, just because it's, I can tell if I'm rigging, then there are some, fun, some fundamental skills I don't have. And then I get all sorts of weird issues like double transformation and stuff just doesn't work the way I want it to. And that's just because I, I am just missing a few a few fundamental skills there. Hey, thanks for getting some uh, Flip Normals courses. Yes, you can absolutely uh, publish a review on it. If you have got, and let's say I got this product here, on the bottom, there will be a leave a review. You can see here, you must be a buyer of this project to submit a review. So you can absolutely leave a review on the bottom. I believe I have, um, I can leave a review on this product here because I have I have bought it. Yes, in this case, I, I, I bought the product. It looks like I bought the product, so I can write a review. 
and then you can do that and you can submit that. So reviews really help help us. So if you if you have ever bought anything and you want to support us, uh, a nice review helps. If you didn't like the product, then an honest review helps us because then we can really improve the product. We do really listen to reviews and we've improved. A, we, we recently had like a significant push in um, internally on how we can improve our tutorials. And that's accumulated you know, over like, I don't know, 20 pages of writing or something. So uh, we do we do take them very seriously. All right, so it is midnight in 10 minutes. Oh, wow. And then I think it's time for me to end the stream in 10 minutes. <laughs> so if, if you guys have, have some more questions, uh, I'm more than happy to answer them for a few more minutes. Might take a few minutes per question, so I just get them in right now. What are the most necessary technical stuff uh, need, you need to know in order to enter the industry as a modeler? Like, do you need to know rigging, animation, UVs, rendering? So out of those things, what you absolutely do need to do is uh, you have to understand UVs. As a modeler, you have to understand UVs because that's literally a part of your job. If you aren't doing that, then uh, you're going to be in uh, you're going to be in trouble. You have to understand UVs. In terms of animation and rigging, it helps to have an overview of it, like what are keyframes and all that. But in but in general, you really don't have to. You don't have to do. Uh, you don't have to do those day to day. Any tips for sculpting clothes? Yes, uh, it's hard. It's very hard. If you want to sculpt clothing, you should really assume that you don't know a whole lot about it. I say this a lot in general. Don't assume things. Assumption is the is like the whatever it's called like it, it leads to bad things i just forgot something really wise now I feel a bit stupid but yeah don't assume you know what cloth looks like get as much reference as you possibly can and get somebody to find clothing which is similar to what you want to make find somebody to take a photo of you in that or you can make it a marvelous designer you can block it out properly a marvelous designer and you can do it that way that that uses a more fundamental approach instead of um Instead of sculpting the clothing, you're more laying out the clothing first, and from there you are you're getting the patterns out. How many characters should we have on your first character portfolio on ArtStation? Is it a good idea just to start one character and add them as time goes by? Yes, it is. It is. Keep it simple. When it comes to characters, you want to show a studio that you have range. If you are doing 10 female characters and they are mostly the same, I don't see a whole lot of point in doing that. The studio will go, yep, this guy clearly knows how to do female characters, but can he do something more? Can he do a fantastic beast? Can he do... Can he do a male character? Can he do a full body character? Really show diversity in there. I always want to say that, like, I always want to show general diversity in your portfolio. So if you're doing characters, maybe you have uh, something like a Warcraft orc or something built from a concept or a War Lord of the Rings character or something like that. Then you have a photorealistic female. Maybe you have a photorealistic child. Uh, maybe you have like a mech kind of character. You have a samurai with tons of clothing on it. No matter what it is, it needs to show range. That is really one of the top tips I can give you. Show significant range in your, in your project or in your portfolio. Learning only anatomy and overall sculpting without caring about the rest of the pipeline and character art, is that a good idea? I, I highly recommend that you do understand the pipeline to a fairly decent level. What I, I think is a much better idea to ease back a little bit on your sculpting skills and improve upon your 3D skills a little bit. Uh, take at least one character through from the first concept sculpt until the very last texture map. So that means you do 
the concept sculpting, you do retopology, you do UVs, texturing and shading, maybe some posing. It's just gonna give you a lot better understanding of how everything works. And that is something which is rewarded in the studios. This is this is kind of what Morton and I have been referring to as ZBrush Cowboys, where you know everything about ZBrush, you know everything about, you, you, well, you may know about sculpting, but you, you don't really know about the, the pipeline. So if somebody's like, hey, can you just make a quick displace map? You're like, mate, a displacement what? So that becomes very hard. So make sure that you have at least an understanding of the pipeline. That's just gonna make your world a lot better. Is sculpting general a requirement for prop artists or environment artists? It is not a figure sculpting is not, but it helps you. It can really, really help you when it comes to breaking things up. Let's say you have to do a prop and there is like, a, it has a wooden spoon or something. It has a wooden, uh, something wooden or something made of rocks on it. And you're like, ah, oh, crap, how do I make this? Well, you just take it in and see where it's sculpted a little bit. Or you have a gun and it has, uh, somebody has been chipping off some pieces off it, of the metal or something. And it's so, it's so much easier to just sculpt that, to just sculpt that in ZBrush. Software for viewing image reference name. That is PureRef. I'm typing this now. PureRef, best thing ever. Are there any better or worse countries or cities to live in as a 3D artist in your personal experience? Uh, in terms of like, in terms of like jobs, uh, there are like a few cities which are exceptional. They would be uh, Vancouver, Montreal, and London. You have so many studios there around. You have a lot of game studios, movie studios, and uh, just in, in all of those. So if you if you want to do VFX and you're in London, you are not gonna have a hard time finding a studio. Uh, what's happening now though is a lot of them are turning remote, but but even so still um, Vancouver, Montreal and uh, and London are doing quite well. How can you start applying for jobs during lockdown? Well, I saw for instance that Square Enix is, are, are they're saying now that you can work remotely. They were allowing remote work, remote work indefinitely. So see if you can find studios which allows for remote work. It seems like most of them would allow it now because it would be entirely irresponsible to allow or to force your staff to work from the actual studio. So uh, yeah, just see see what, what they're allowing. Did you experience fear before posting work online? How did you, how did you cope with that? I mean, yes, <laughs> it's always scary to post your work online. I'm scared every single time I put a new YouTube video. You know, you're putting a bit of yourself in the video and in the, in the work. It's not like you can detach yourself. We always say that oh, your work is your work, and it's not a part of you. No, but but it still is. It's still a part of you, and. You're, you get 99 nice comments and you say, you have one comment which says that you're pronouncing a word in a weird way and you're breathing in a, an aggressive sense or something like that. And suddenly you feel a bit bad or, you know, the negative, the negative comments outweigh the positive comments so much when it comes to like how you weight them. So, um, yeah, the root put in freeze. I just stopped working. <laughs> I'm just talking instead now for the last for the last minutes. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it it is a bit intimidating. The way I the way I solve it uh, sometimes when I post on work online is I post it and I just never look at it. I recently posted some work on ArtStation and I just uh, posted it and I just logged off <laughs> and I haven't logged on since. <laughs> that that's you know one way of doing it. Another way is just to go. All right, hit me with all your notes. Just like full on embracing the feedback and you just know it's gonna come. Just take it for take it for what it is and um, just embrace it. All right, so we have time for maybe one or two questions. 
now before we will head to bed because I've been streaming a lot this week and it's it's a lot of work but it's a lot of fun I'm really enjoying this Canada London or London UK yeah London in Canada I don't think has an amazing VFX experience uh, but London in the UK I mean the, the London that is that is a main creative hub in Europe I mean in Europe there really isn't a whole lot there aren't really a whole lot of hubs um, happening there. I think Germany is growing a little bit, but growing it's a little. Bit not as close as London. Though. No, and some of the studios there might be scattered around, yeah. but in London, like some of the studios just moved around a little bit. Uh, but um, you know, just like five, maybe seven years ago, there was a five-minute walk between MPC Frames or DNIC. <laughs> I mean, they were right there. Timmy has an interesting question. If you can make friends at work if you don't drink alcohol. Yeah, that is actually a really good one. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, I mean, you absolutely can. Uh, I uh, I didn't drink a whole lot of, uh, at the end of my career, and I still made friends there. But you you gotta go to the pub. <laughs> That's... Yeah, you you can go to the pub. You can, you can not drink. Some people are like, oh, why are you not drinking and stuff? Because I definitely had nights where I didn't, you know, went to the pub or maybe had a headache and so on. I didn't want to drink. It's it's okay. <laughs> You maybe yeah. you can do the thing. I have a friend who doesn't drink because he has an issue. He has like an allergy. What he does, he takes a glass from someone else that's finished their drinks. It just holds it all night, <laughs> so it looks like he's drinking. Great. But yeah, it should be fine if you're not drinking. It shouldn't be an issue. Jengi has a question. Any n not art related? Uh, got any movie recommendations for dark comedy? Uh, yes. Uh, what we do in the shadows? Ah, oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Oh, that's a great one. What was the other one? Uh, from the same director that made me cry a lot. Oh yeah, the um, Jojo Rabbit. Oh, Jojo Rabbit, such a dark one. Made me, it's so funny and it made me cry a lot. Yeah. yeah. If a uh, displaced map changes geometry, adds polygon, how is it different from using a higher subdivision model? One of the, um, the differences between those is that if you are, like the, the problem a displaced map solves is that you want your viewport performance to be really high, meaning you want your model to be as low poly as possible. You want your animators to be able to animate your model, but you still want in the render f to, to have all the, all the things from ZBrush. So essentially what's, what you're saying is that you are subdividing your model at render time only, and when you are subdividing, use the displacement map to get all the details back into it from ZBrush. Do you guys watch anime for reference? Uh, no. <laughs> Not for reference, but I'm trying to make Henning watch bro uh, Full Metal Brotherhood with me. <laughs> yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I watched it, it like 10 times already, but you know. Is it recommended to publish uh, an art station tutorial, the final render of a, of a character, even if I change some things? Uh, I assume what you're meaning is, it does it, is it good to follow a tutorial and publish the end result? It, it can be, but I find that it's more helpful if you make your own character. I would be a bit careful with being like, hey, I followed introduction to sculpting and here's my end result if you're applying for a job. Because at that level, you need to not rely on tutorials for specific things. You can rely on tutorials to learn some features here and there, but it shouldn't be, you shouldn't need a tutorial in order to Final as a project, if that makes sense. Silver plasma guy knows what's up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do one more question. It is uh, two minutes past midnight here. We've been saying that for like ten questions. Like yeah, that. but it, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> questions, please, <laughs> fast before he changes his mind. <laughs> What is your opinion on, okay, last question now. Uh, what is your opinion on posting whips work in progress as a student looking for internships? I, I think it's a good idea to show work in progress, but that's more to, maybe you can have that as a separate blog because uh, it shows where you're coming from. It shows how fast you've been progressing, how fast you're working on projects. It's If you're showing a work in progress piece from like a year ago and it's at a, terrible state and today you're showing awesome work 
that's awesome. That means you're improving tremendously. A lot of it is not just to see where you currently are, but see your trajectory. How are, how are you today versus how were you a year ago? Can you expect to, to improve significantly or are you, well, you're pretty stale? But if you are for your final portfolio, do not show work in progress pictures. Show like breakdowns and such. Maybe you could have like a final, like showing the steps of it. But don't just post your work in progress along with your, your final renders. Be very clear what's final and be very clear on what's work in progress. Because you don't want the recruiter or studio directors or anyone like that to mistake work in progress for final pieces. But all right, guys, thank you so much for uh, watching. This has been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed this. And apologies for not sculpting for the last like 10 minutes or so. I just want to talk instead. <laughs> okay. It's been a lot of fun. And we're probably going to do more of this tomorrow. Just as a final reminder, we have um, we have a lot of cool um, products now on uh, the Flip Moments Marketplace. We have Introduction to Maya, Read to Poly and Character, Flip Moments Lighting Scenes, Intro to Painter. Just a bunch of cool stuff. And it's all it's all 50% off now. Um, Check out the um, check it out if you're interested in getting something for to improve your art. But yeah, thank you so much for watching, and this stream will be available for um, for viewing on our channel as well. So see you tomorrow. Good night. Good night.